Uh, good morning, everyone. We will start our event now. Okay. Thank you. Okay, good morning. Uh, thank you very much for joining us for the announcement of the UNODC annual report, uh, Synthetic Drugs in East and Southeast Asia, Latest Developments and Challenges for this year, which goes into the information from 2022. Uh, my name is Kavinvidi Supaponte Vasako, and I am a UNODC illicit drugs analyst based at the UNODC regional office here in Bangkok. With me here today are Mr. Jeremy Douglas, uh, UNODC Regional Representative for Southeast Asia and the Pacific, uh, Ms. Sita Kun Weladi, Director of the Foreign Affairs Bureau of the Office of the Narcotics Control Board of Thailand, and Mr. Inshik Shim, illicit, uh, drugs Lead Illicit Drugs Analyst at UNODC. So before we begin today, I would like to go over the agenda a little bit so we know what we have in store. First, we will have some opening remarks by uh, Mr. Jeremy Douglas and Ms. Sita Kunwiladi, and then we will go into a briefing on the major findings of the report by Mr. Inshik Shim. So for this announcement, we have uh, people joining us here in person at the SCCT, and also viewers who are joining us online. So for viewers who are joining us online, uh, for information, we will be taking questions from the online platforms as well. So if you have any questions during the course of this briefing, please feel free to drop them in the chat, and we will address them after uh, the briefing, along with questions from the floor. So without further ado, I would like to invite uh, Mr. Jeremy Douglas, UNODC Regional Representative for Southeast Asia and the Pacific, to deliver opening remarks. Thank you, Kundi. Uh, welcome, everybody. Good morning. Uh, thank you for making time to join us here today. Uh, I'd like to particularly thank our colleagues at Professor, the Office of the Narcotics Control Board of Thailand. Uh, congratulations on yesterday, uh, which is why the Secretary General is not here. They had a major case just yesterday, and he's in Rayong as a result. Um, but uh, the purpose of today's briefing is to give you the latest snapshot of the synthetic drug situation in Asia Pacific, and traditionally that has meant methamphetamine. Uh, that said, the market is really diversifying at the moment, and we're seeing emergence of other synthetic drugs, some of which will surprise the scale of that change. Uh, there have been significant changes in the market. I think it's important for us today, as we look at the data that will be presented, that we consider that this is the first report since borders reopened uh, in the post-pandemic period. So in 2022, until about this point last year, still a lot of borders had restrictions. Those restrictions meant there were restrictions on criminal movements. Uh, but those restrictions dropped over the second half of last year, and that is when we started seeing a reconnection of criminal groups that traditionally had met within the subregion to facilitate deals and trafficking of narcotic drugs. They started reconnecting trafficking patterns, started kind of, in a sense, uh, reestablishing themselves to the pre-pandemic stage. Uh, so we've seen some changes in routes that are very significant. There's another remarkable trend that my colleague Inchik will brief on in a moment, which is a significant sub-regional change in trafficking routes, which has had regional repercussions. Uh, we'll go into that detail. And as I said earlier, uh, the developments in another synthetic drug, which are very, very significant for this region and potentially uh, connected regions. The other thing that I would highlight and, and recommend you pay attention to in his briefing is the changes in the chemical trade, which have resulted to some extent in what we're witnessing now. The significance of the chemical trade should not be underestimated. It fundamentally underpins the synthetic drug business. You cannot produce the synthetic drugs that are flowing across this region without access to chemicals. Those chemicals are moving in volumes at much higher volumes, excuse me, than the drugs themselves uh, because you need multiple times the volume of chemicals to produce the drugs. So very important agenda for this region to start considering is, is the, the chemical agenda. Uh, so with that, I will draw my comments to a close. And again, thank you for coming. Uh, thank ONCB for joining us here today. A great partner for UNODC in country and at a regional level as we both work together to help address uh, the significant drug challenge this, this region faces. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much, Shukun Jeremy. And I would like to invite Ms. Sita Kunwiladi, Director of the Foreign Affairs Bureau of ONCB. Uh, thank you, Kundi, as well. Uh, Jeremy Douglas, UNODC Regional Rep, and all the guests, thank you for your time here today. On behalf of the, of the ONCB, Office of the Narcotics Control Board, um, uh, first of all, please accept apology from my boss, the Secretary Kunvichai, because I'll, 
um, he very busy, as you said earlier, and unforeseen circumstances, so he couldn't make up today. So it's a great pressure for me to deliver, to join you, deliver the opening remarks today and the announcement of the annual report of the UNODC regarding the synthetic drugs. Yeah, um, it's very important. In Thailand, synthetic drugs, in particular methamphetamine, remain drugs of the serious threats of which large quantity of drugs seized and also a majority of people addicted and also receiving treatment. Transnational crimes and drug syndicate have been targeting Thailand and neighboring country as the transit point and also as well the markets smuggling drugs from the Golden Triangle and also um, chemicals and because uh, to the Golden Triangle itself for the illicit production. Given great cooperation among us, uh, Thailand and the country in the sub-region in particular uh, is come out to the result of the large amount of seized drugs as well as precursors and chemicals. Um, is uh, you know the same tune like uh, Kun Jeremy just said. So uh, the key message from the Thai government at this moment, apart from our cooperation and great result, we would like to propose regarding the management of the safe handling and disposal of such seized drugs and also chemical. I do ask the UNODC for the support and also the donor countries. It's quite a good news that uh, Australia will be the leader, I think because they table the resolution on the safe disposal on drugs and chemicals as well at the CND. So moreover, with the latest trends of more diversifying of synthetic psychoactive drugs, um, pro products increasing use of non-control because of chemicals, and I do believe that forensic information can support us to understand more about these developments as well as for the investigation and our cooperation in the future for effective, uh, not just only law enforcement, but for, you know, for policy making as well for the effective response. So I would like to express my appreciation to the global smart programs of the UNODC for your, you know, timely, timely response in these and new initiatives to enhance forensic capacity of member countries. In conclusion, Thailand fully commits to addressing these drug threats and working closely with the counterparts, and in particular UNODC, and at regional and international levels. At this end, I do believe this report will give us a better understanding of the recent trends of synthetic drugs, which will be beneficial for all stakeholders, uh, you know, for us to redesign the policy advocating appropriate drug policy and also the, you know, implementing effective intervention and responses. I would like to express my deep appreciation again for the contribution, the continued, sorry, <laughs> the continued contrib contribution uh, of UNODC representative, you in particular, Jeremy, and your team, you know, for a long time in sharing with us and your support forever. And thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much for your remarks. Uh, and now, without further ado, I think we can go straight into the briefing of the report. Inchik, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, once again, my name is Inchik Shim. I'm a lead drug analyst for the University Regional Office for Southeast Asia and the Pacific. Thank you very much for today, uh, for coming over here. I'm pleased to share the uh, major findings of the 2023 Synthetic Drug Report for East and Southeast Asia. I'd like to start with this slide, uh, which summarized the main uh, themes of the report. Uh, there, is a, there was a high level of supply of math into 2022, and we still uh, witness the uh, continued uh, the supply at high levels. And also, we, s we witnessed the uh, major shift in the trafficking routes of methamphetamines in 2022 and also early 2023. And with the relaxation of the uh, border restriction, uh, mobility restrictions, uh, we see the uh, organized crime groups in the region has been trying to reconnect with other uh, organized crime groups uh, based in uh, South Asia and the Pacific as well. Uh, once again, we were able to see the record low wholesale price of methamphetamines. And we, uh, we've also witnessed the uh, diversified the mass tablet brands uh, since the uh, military takeover 
in February 2021 in Myanmar. It was highlighted by the uh, Director of Foreign Affairs and also Jeremy that there has been a, a increased uh, non controlled chemicals being used by organized crime groups for the production of synthetic drugs. Um, the data on demand is very limited, but nonetheless, we were able to see that the polydrug use involving methamphetamine uh, remains a problematic uh, for several countries in the region. And what is most important probably uh, of the, all the findings of this report, uh, we were able to see that the organized crime groups been adopting the same supply-driven uh, market expansion strategy for ketamine. And also, we see the emergence of several new synthetic drug products in the region. Uh, let me start with the methamphetamine. Uh, in 2022, the seizures of mass are decreased for the first time after reported the continuous increases in seizures of mass over the last decade. In 2022, the mass seizure totaled uh, 151 tons, which is about 20 tons less than 2021. Uh, this, but one particular trend continued, which is the uh, dominant, uh, predominant majority of methamphetamine was seized in Southeast Asia, accounting for 91.4% of total mass seizures in East and Southeast Asia. But if you look at very closely, uh, uh, three, about 75%, I would say, was seized in Cambodia, Laos, Thailand, uh, Myanmar, and Vietnam. But these five countries, basically, it shows that the consolidation of the mass production in the Mekong region. Um, this is the map that shows the change of the uh, mass seizures in 2021 and 2022. You can see that the large decrease were reported from Thailand. Basically, Thailand sees 17 tons less of mass in 2022. And also, steep decrease was noted in uh, particular Yunnan, China. Uh, China as a whole, about seven tons less mass was seized. So the mass seizure total in China was a record low since 2009. Uh, combined this decrease in these two countries, basically uh, 24 tons. So that drove the uh, overall decrease in mass seizures in East and Southeast Asia in 2022. It is very important to note that the seizures of mass in Myanmar increased in 2022, uh, especially the crystal mass seizures skyrocketed in uh, Myanmar. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the mass production has been consolidated into Mekong regions. However, the mass coming out from the Mekong regions that reached many different parts of the Asia Pacific. Uh, we see the mass coming out from the Mekong to Australia, New Zealand, Korea, Japan, and also uh, Bangladesh and India side as well. It is really important to see how mass is being moved within Myanmar in order to understand how mass is being trafficked out of Myanmar. Because organized crime groups have been trying to find ways to bring large quantities of mass out of Myanmar to reach destination. Uh, in 22, there was a, a dramatic change in terms of the mass trafficking within Myanmar. When you look at it, um, the largest quantities of crystal mass was seized in Mandalay, which is in the central part of Myanmar. Mandalay is an important transit location where the mass is coming out from Shan State to transiting through Mandalay to go to southern parts of Myanmar, such as Mon and Kain State, and also the western part of Myanmar, such as Rakhine State. It shows that organized crime groups in Myanmar have been trying to move the crystal mass out of Shan using uh, Mandalay's transit to disperse to different parts of Myanmar. And also you can see the increases in the crystal mass seizures in southern parts of Myanmar, Mon and Kain, and western part of Myanmar, Lakhine. Important point in Shan is for the first time length third in 2022 when it comes to crystal mass seizures, not the number one but third, it shows that organized crime groups have been trying to find ways to m bring this crystal mess out of Shan from different channels of Myanmar. Uh, interesting part is, the, you know, we noted that Mon and Kain uh, seizures of crystal mess increased quite a bit in 2022. But if you look at the mass seizure data in Thailand, like across borders, like Tak and uh, Kanchanaburi, those provinces were not recorded as a, a top 10 crystal mass crystal mass seizures in that country. Uh, that shows us that the trafficking groups have been trying to bring this crystal mass from southern regions of Myanmar by maritime route, instead of crossing the land border directly from Myanmar. This is a particular example. Uh, in February 2023, 
uh, Myanmar already seized the uh, 1.91 tons of crystalline mats uh, on the southern tip of Myanmar, known as Kotong. Uh, this is the by far the largest record quantities for crystalline mat seizures in that part of the Myanmar. And also several major crystalline mat seizures were reported in Mandalay, in Lutu, the southern part of Myanmar, also western part of Myanmar as well. Um, also, the, uh, the trafficking group's been using the mixed uh, trafficking modalities, uh, maritime and land route as well. Uh, this is a particular example reported from Malaysia that in February 2023, 1.8 tons of crystal mats were seized in perils. Uh, the Malaysian authority informed us that it was first a traffic by maritime uh, from Myanmar to Thailand, and then after that, the cross by land border. Uh, so that what we want to highlight here is that organized crime groups have been always trying to look for, circumvent the law enforcement responses adopted by the Mekong and also Southeast Asian law enforcement authorities. So in 2022 and early 2023, we have noted that maritime trafficking has gained a significant importance in crystal mass trafficking in the region. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, it is really important to also highlight that organized crime groups have been continuously targeting the land borders in the Mekong. Uh, one is Laos. Uh, we have highlighted several times over the last few years that the borders between Thailand and Laos has been uh, targeted by organized crime groups for mass trafficking. Uh, but now we also starting to witnessing the border between Laos and Cambodia has been targeted significantly, uh, especially from Laos to Pakse to the Stung Trung of Cambodia. There has been a several seizures reported from Cambodian authorities that the drugs been uh, trafficked from Laos side. Um, and I think it is really also important to highlight that how much mass has been trafficked from Shan State, Myanmar to the westward directions to Bangladesh and India. The Yaba trafficking to Bangladesh, mass tablet trafficking basically, is an old story. We all know that. However, we started witnessing the increased quantities of crystal mass has been trafficked from Myanmar to Bangladesh. In 2022, Bangladesh authorities seized 120 kilos of crystal mass. You may think that this is not much compared to Mekong countries, but this is a just start. And we see the steady flows of crystal mats at the same time as tablets from Myanmar to Bangladesh as well as India. It's literally every day these two countries, in the, these authorities in these two countries have been reporting every day the seizures of mats, and particularly these tea bag packagings. There's a huge potential for organized crime groups to stimulate demand of mass in these two countries and will be, it will guarantee the massive profit for them given the size of the population of these countries. Mentioned earlier, but that there has been a, again the uh, record row price of the uh, crystal mass, uh, which is uh, quite concerning despite the decreases in seizures of crystal mass, dash, uh, the mass in general. It shows that the supply remains at high in 2022. Uh, for instance, when you look at the Thailand data, uh, 2022, one kilos of crystal mats was about US uh, $4,000. Uh, in Laos, it's about US $2,000. Uh, but when we met with the uh, border uh, officials uh, in Thailand, uh, some informed us that it could be as low as $1,000 per kilogram. So this is really low price. And I remember that uh, it was uh, before the mass supply kicked in, uh, from the Golden Triangle side. It was close to $20,000 per kilograms, but it's continuously going down, which is a significant concern. Uh, another major development is uh, the diverse, uh, I would say, actors involved in mass tablet supply. Uh, when you look at it, um, you know, not major mass tablet brands consumed in the region is 999 and Y1. Uh, those are two. And when you look at it, these other logos, basically, that do not belong to 991 or Y1 has increased quite rapidly over the last few years. Uh, especially in 2021, there was 13% of the old mass tablet seized in Thailand were packaged in the other branding. Uh, but in 2022, it further increased uh, to 26%. Uh, this is a major development. Uh, it kind of concurrent uh, with the military takeover in Myanmar in February 2021. Uh, non control chemical, uh, this is a major challenge for this region, but also it has become very prominent issues uh, across the worldwide. Uh, when you look at it, um, 
you know, this region had a problem uh, in terms of the dealing with the controlled substances, controlled chemical as well. But because of the increased use of non-controlled chemical, it add more complexity uh, for authorities to deal with that. And uh, one particular example is a benzyl cyanide, which can be used for production of main mass precursor P2P. We see that these chemicals have been seized in uh, Mekong, in route to Myanmar, as well as in Myanmar as well. This chemical is not controlled internationally. And uh, this is just one example. There are other uh, chemicals that are non-controlled in nature, like sodium methoxide, ethyl acetate. Those things can be adopted during the process of production of synthetic drugs. But those are not controlled add more complexity for authorities to deal with this ever-evolving synthetic drug uh, problem. And we are also, we've been also uh, closely monitoring the uh, trade of chemicals uh, on, by online uh, business, business, business to business platform known as B2B, as well as the social uh, networks. And the, the companies, um, there have been, uh, some of the companies have been uh, actively trading uh, those non control chemical, which is, does not constitute a legal uh, problem because it's non control But once these con chemicals are controlled internationally, they quickly move their operation into dark web, and they're offering the same substances through dark web site. And also, in dark web, they offer other services such as mislabeling, fake product packaging, and specialized freight forwarding services. So these all uh, con New. contribute to the uh, evolving synthetic drug problems in this region. The recent one. And I'd like to also highlight some of the other organized crime groups, uh, basically based in the out outside these regions, uh, Mexican drug cartels, and also African drug syndicates, also West, uh, West Asian drug trafficking groups. But I'd like to just focus on the Mexican drug cartels today. Uh, this region uh, has been used uh, as a transit uh, by Mexican drug cartels for trafficking mass uh, in particular to Oceania. Um, um, there were a few cases that Hong Kong authorities seized, like liquid methamphetamines that traffic from North America, is Mexico basically to, uh, uh, as a t transit uh, to Australia. But also Philippine authorities reported uh, the small laboratories that were used for the uh, converting liquid mass to crystal methamphetamine that was uh, set up by the uh, French and Canadian some, uh, Filipino nationals that were the further investigation revealed that they were connected to Mexican drug cartels. Uh, when it comes to use, uh, as I mentioned earlier, there is a very limited understanding. However, we were able to see a lot of mass users, are in fact, uh, the polydrug users. Uh, when you look at it in Thailand, there's one research found that 44% of mass users uh, use other substances together with meth, um, mainly for anti-depression, uh, uh, pharmaceutical products, but as well as ketamines, ecstasy, and heroin. Uh, in Vietnam, even uh, close to 60% of users identified in the countries using mass together with ketamine, heroin, and cannabis as well. Um, I, I share some of the major findings on mass, and I would like to move on to ketamine. Um, for ketamine, in 2022, record quantities of ketamine were seized. 27 photons of this drug were seized in East and Southeast Asia. As you can see, the seizures, uh, increases in seizures were driven by Southeast Asian countries. Um, you will be surprised, Cambodian alone seized about half of the 27.4 tons. And this is mainly because of the industrial scale ketamine productions been taking place in Cambodia. This is just one example of the photo. But let me show you the uh, short video to show the scale of the academy production in Cambodia. Yes, UNODC was uh, there uh, to assess this chemical production facilities in Cambodia, also storage facilities. Uh, Cambodian Authority sees uh, 16 uh, industrial-scale ketamine production facilities and the chemical storage sites. Uh, this is the biggest lab that I've ever seen during my career with the UNODC, 
and the, the direct sizes about at least 5,000 liters, really, really big scale uh, facilities. It tells us that there is a powerful organized crime groups behind of setting up these facilities, and they're pushing this supply of ketamine into the region. What we have observed in the mass market, which is quite concerning, because we know how mass market has evolved since the supply kicked in in mid 2010s. We are seeing the same trajectory from the ketamine supply. Okay. Uh, ketamine is not only produced in Cambodia, we all know the ketamine is also produced in the Golden Triangle. And uh, one of the major developments that we have seen is the mixed shipments of ketamine and mesamphetamines. There were several cases like this in 2022, which were not really observed previous years. It may tell us that organized crime groups have been trying to stimulate ketamine demand by putting together with crystal mass, which is more widely used in this region. For other synthetic drugs, ecstasy, much smaller market uh, compared to mass and ketamines. Uh, when it comes to seizures in 2022, about seven million tablets were seized. When you look at the mass tablets, it's close to one billion. So we are talking about very small segments of the synthetic drug markets. Um, major uh, source is still remains Europe, uh, countries in Europe. And then the seizures are mainly made in like Malaysia, Indonesia, and also some East Asian countries. Uh, what is important is the uh, ecstasy, the main ingredient, MDMA, is being mixed together with different substances, uh, primarily with ketamines and mats, and also some other products like benzodiazepine substances. Uh, when you look at it, this called happy water product, uh, it's been emerging uh, across Southeast Asian countries, uh, Thailand, La Laos, uh, Myanmar, uh, Cambodia, Vietnam, and Indonesia. And when you look at it, the Packagings are all different. Uh, it shows that the, uh, the actors involved in production of happy waters is not unified, not like crystal mass production. And also there are several uh, new synthetic, drug, synthetic substances were reported from the uh, countries in the region. Um, and also we have noticed that the synthetic cannabinoids has been uh, most frequently uh, identified the uh, synthetic, new synthetic substance. Uh, in the region, and there, uh, some of the uh, law enforcement authorities have been informed us that, that some of the users prefer to use synthetic cannabinoids uh, because it, it does not really have a distinct uh, cannabis smell. Uh, to conclude, uh, let me repeat some of the major findings uh, before I started. First, the mass supply level remained hard in 2022, and decreases in seizures of mass in 2022 it seems very, very uh, clear to us that the shift in the trafficking now have resulted in this organized crime group successfully putting this mess into the market. That led to the lack of low price of the crystal mess. And also we see the diversify the uh, mess tablet brands uh, in the region that has further accelerated in 2022. And the polydrug use of mess remains problematic in the region. And non control chemicals, and also organized crime groups in using cre creative chemical uh, uh, methods and sourcing the chemicals through the online, uh, through the dark web as well, uh, to meet the, the scale of the mass and other synthetic drug production. Um, Supply-driven uh, market expansion strategy is very clear for cannabis markets. I think all the region, uh, needs, uh, all the countries in the region need to be prepared we have been informed from the country that are not really known for ketamine use, been starting to seize increased quantities of ketamine. This is quite concerning. And all in all, uh, I would like to highlight that this uh, evolving the synthetic drug markets uh, can be uh, possible without the uh, steady supply of chemicals. And we really need to work on these chemical matters. Uh, I will leave it at that. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Uh, thank you very much, Inshik, for that uh, comprehensive briefing on the major findings in the report. So uh, before we go into the questions, I, we have some questions online already, so I think we'll take two from online questions, and then we'll open the floor to people here for questions from uh, who are with us here at FCCT. So for the first question that we have, um, I would like to address this perhaps to Kun Jeremy. 
Uh, the question is, uh, that's a significant change in trafficking in Myanmar. How did that happen, and how did no one notice this change in patterns with you? Uh, I think we have to remember traffickers are smart. Uh, their job is to evade the police, uh, to try to move product to market and connect uh, to the market. Uh, and uh, the picture didn't really emerge from Yunnan uh, for the rest of the world uh, until very recently. Uh, and that drop in Yunnan and the drop as well in Thailand, which really is pronounced in northern Thailand last year, was a clear uh, uh, rooting around uh, northern Myanmar, or north, sorry, excuse me, northern Thailand and the Golden Triangle, uh, pushing that supply down uh, the middle of, of the country to the Andaman Sea, as, as Inchik rightly highlighted. I think it's really important to, to note that I think a lot of the product, given the price data that we just looked at, continuing to decline, uh, that other reports from all the countries about the availability on the street being extremely high, I think we have to look at the fact that just more drugs sailed by. Traffickers were a little more successful last year than in the previous, uh, and they were able to connect to market, mainly using maritime routes uh, that were not noticed by, by people uh, over the course of the year. I think one more thing I would highlight on Myanmar that is very important was the other slide that he had about the small tableting operations that are running uh, in Shan State. That's a massive change from only two years ago. There are now a whole host of brands of Yaba or methamphetamine tablets flooding Laos, uh, Thailand, uh, even making their way into to Cambodia and Vietnam, as well as within Myanmar itself. But that diversity is associated with a whole diversity of armed groups and militias within the country which are tableting uh, the drug. Uh, at this time. So we see the drop of, of the ones that are produced by the, the Northern Alliance group or the, the, the Northern group as they so call it and the Southern group as they so call the Triple Nine and the Y1. But frankly, all those little brands reflect the fact that there's been an uptick amongst all the small armed groups in the country. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And I think one more question online before the floor questions. This one, I think, uh, Pastor Inchik, if you could take this question. There's a question about ketamine. Um, so that the amount of ketamine seized in the region is staggering. So where is it all going? Who is using it? And is there really a, really a demand for ketamine? Uh, this is actually a uh, very excellent question. Uh, this ketamine uh, use, uh, we have seen this that in meth market as well. Supply can create demand um, when it comes to control substances. Um, for ketamine right now, mainly the biggest user populations in China and Taiwan but now we see the ketamine use has been increased, increasing across the countries in the region. First, starting with the Southeast Asian countries, like Thailand, uh, for instance, and Vietnam. But now we see the ketamine use has increased in East Asian countries as well. Uh, my home country, Korea, as well, uh, they started to see increased quantities of ketamine, as, w uh, as well as the people being identified as ketamine users. Uh, Japan, the same, and Australia and New Zealand started to see also ketamines and people uh, involved in the ketamine use. So we see that the, how this supply can create demand in the region, and I think the, uh, that's the, uh, so the user population in the region has been uh, basically ex expanded. Thank you very much, Inshik. Yes, uh, now from the information on ketamine, just, just to add uh, a little bit to, to Inshik's responses, uh, we saw that there was a record amount of ketamine seized in uh, 2022, most of it from Cambodia, but actually virtually all countries and territories in East and Southeast Asia seized more ketamine in 2022 than they did in uh, 2021. So the only, uh, only Hong Kong, China seized less, but everywhere else increasing ketamine seizures across the board in the region. So uh, does anyone here at FCCT have any questions? Yes, uh, there's a microphone back there. So uh, please, uh, Ms. May Wong, I think it's you first to raise your hand. <laughs> Thank you. Good morning, May from Channel News Asia, Singapore Television Station. Thank you very much for the very comprehensive report as well as a description of that. Got a couple of questions I'd like to find out just on the back of the ketamine question is do you foresee ketamine overtaking methamphetamine then being the most used drug in Southeast Asia because of the seizure? And um, when we talk about this increase in the use of maritime routes, do you see that becoming the new trend going forward and how difficult 
is that going to be tracked? Because when you're out at sea, would that make it more difficult to circumvent, or excuse me, to actually confiscate as opposed to land check borders? Thank you. Uh, for at, at this point, it's quite difficult to, to see the catamaran will take over mass market. Uh, if anything, I think the, the mass will remain. I think the, uh, the primary uh, synthetic drugs in the region uh, has a long history of the mass use in this particular world. But the catamaran will definitely uh, you know, expand. I think the, uh, right now we see that the, the, the trajectory is uh, really happening. Uh, but taking over math might be little uh, to all to say and might be unlikely uh, from my point of view. I would just add on the ketamine that I think what we're looking at is, is organized crime groups very creatively diversifying their product line. And as he said with the mixed shipments, they're putting ketamine into methamphetamine shipments so that the, the end networks that distribute this stuff to the street are distributing two drugs instead of simply one. They're building market right now. So, uh, but again, I agree with him. I don't think it'll overtake methamphetamine. Methamphetamine is a very different drug. It's high, highly, highly addictive. Ketamine is a bit niche, but nonetheless extremely concerning. And I think we have to look at the fact that this region has a massive population base. So you can, there's a lot of possible consumers in this region. Over two billion people, if you count in East and Southeast Asia. It's an enormous market. On the second question, I could take it on the maritime, uh, May. Um, you know, I think, uh, as you interrogate the data and you look at what happened inside Myanmar, it's most definitely true that the shipments were missed. Uh, and especially when you look at that price data, a lot of product literally, quote unquote, sailed by uh, on the high seas. And I think we now look at what happened yesterday uh, with ONCB. The Secretary General was involved in a maritime seizure just yesterday of just over 900 kilos, uh, just to the east of this uh, town. The point that uh, we kind of made at the beginning was the reconnection of criminal groups that has occurred since borders reopened. There's been movement, like they, criminals were also similarly restricted by COVID border closures. Uh, there are also reluctance after the Anon operation to use some encrypted apps. They're now reconnecting, they're making face-to-face -face contact in this region, facilitating major shipments as we speak. Thailand in the last month alone has seized over eight tons of crystal methamphetamine. Last year they only seized nine and a bit. So that's in 30 days. So we're looking at a massive change in trafficking patterns as we speak, uh, as these major loads are negotiated and shipped. Maritime will feature heavily in that for the reason you mentioned, which is, frankly, it's hard to police the high seas, uh, especially on thing, uh, oceans like the Andaman that are wide open and lots of fishing vessels, uh, but even apparently in the Gulf of Thailand. Maybe I just add on a little bit regarding the you know, the operation-wise, the law enforcement, upon your question regarding whether it would be uh, more difficult or not, in my opinion, I don't think it would be even harder because actually based on, because to traffic by sea is going to be the big batch, you know, for the return of investment because they need to, you know, that's mean they're going to move in a big, big batch. So actually it's based on intelligence, yes. yeah, purely for the big one. So actually it's not, harder, but it's as hard as, hard as the, the trafficking by land, anyway. Yeah. yeah, you can't search all the vessels. It's intelligence that led to what happened yesterday, and it's intelligence that will lead to others like it. Uh, thank you. Actually, um, if you don't mind, there was one question online that related to the discussion just now, so I, if you don't mind, I would like to ask that one first before we go back to the floor. Uh, so we have a question, actually, for ONCB. Uh, the question is that uh, Thailand has made a lot of big mass seizures recently, and we mentioned already the one yesterday in Rayong. So the question is, you know, what's happened, what happened for that case, and also how frequently is the uh, uh, Gulf of Thailand being used for trafficking? Actually, to be honest, it's just recently, just recently, it's kind of the, the resuming of normalcy at this moment. Yes. They try, um, for the criminals, they try to find the routes uh, as always, how can they make the profits as much as possible? And okay, when we press the pressures on the north and on the northeast, you see the trends of shifting the rules to the west, and maybe just uh, a little bit add on the, the trends earlier, how can we know that in Myanmar they changed the routes as well? Uh, okay. 
we just had a meeting, bilateral meeting with the Myanmar as well. They analyze uh, similar to the, and your is correct. It's responsive to the real situation, though, because uh, Myanmar also noticed the shifting of the rules to the west as well, in particular for the big batch of the you know ice and ketamine in particular. Yeah. So uh, for Thailand, it's just. A coming back of situation actually uh, actually we found the more often use of the maritime trafficking during the COVID-19 but because of the response is quick was quick um, uh, we can you know see the drifting of a lot of drugs eyes and we have close cooperation with the neighboring countries because we share the same situation with the Cambodia and Vietnam and in particular for ONC, ONCB, we have the you know the minister counselor uh, from ONCB based in Hanoi, based in Phnom Penh. So we we follow up and monitor the situation closely and follow tracks of the criminal. So during the COVID, they 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 change the rules to the west, the Andaman Sea in, instead. Now as uh, in the south at this moment. I think it's just the coming back, just coming back. So we, we will keep monitored and you know expand the investigation with uh, our counterparts closely. Yeah. I think the point that she made just now about its return to normal, normalcy. So we're looking at a return to the pre-pandemic patterns where we used to see massive shipments that were moving uh, and that was the pattern in 2019 particularly. And I think we're back at that, that pattern or looking at, a, uh, we're in the middle of it right now. Thank you very much. And from the floor, please. Good morning. Uh, my name is Esther Roman. I'm with the DEA uh, Drug Enforcement Administration from the U.S. I have a question. You touched a little bit on the influence or the presence of the Mexican DTOs in the region. Um, do you know if those are related to CJNG or Sinaloa? And you said that there were meth labs that had been set up here in the region. Do you have data saying that those that meth labs have actually been seized and the workers are coming in from, I think you said, French, Cambodian, and Filipino workers. So I'm very interested in whether or not, A, you have, you can, you can see, say if there's actually a Mexican DTO presence versus an influence of the Mexican DTOs. That's my first question. The second question is on the markings of the meth tablet, the Yaba tablets, the, the Y1 or the 999. Mr. Douglas touched a little bit on it as far as being able to associate those labels to different areas where they're being made. Can you touch a little bit on that? And then one more question. Are you seeing any fentanyl in the region or do you see that that's becoming a problem, going to become a problem here? Thank you. I will stop you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. For the uh, Mexican cartels, uh, yes, we do see the uh, influence. I wouldn't say that they are, Mexican is producing mass here. Um, there is no need for Mexicans coming here to, not Mexican, Mexican drug cartels are coming here to produce uh, methamphetamine in the region. The case that I uh, mentioned during my presentation, <coughs> that a particular uh, area, countries uh, in East and South has been targeted as the uh, transit for mass traffic from Mexico. Uh, one is Philippines, and then uh, also Hong Kong, and also Korea. Uh, there were three, uh, these three were, uh, I would say, the targeted as Mexican drug cartels as a transit for trafficking crystal mass to Australia. The particular lab, uh, it was very small scale in fact, and it was not Cambodian, it was French and Canadian and Filipino, and there's three, group, uh, three people uh, set up a small scale, uh, I would say, the conversion, mass conversion lab. Uh, there is no, uh, uh, there is no evidence that that there was uh, the mass was mass was produced from the scratch. Uh, it was more likely, highly likely, the liquid mass was imported in the Philippines and then uh, turned um, uh, converted in that lab because there was no precursor chemicals, but just for the. Uh, chemical they needed for conversion for liquid mass to crystal mass. So all in all, uh, there is no really need for Mexican drug cartels to come over here to expand the market because there is already strong organized crime groups 
between uh, feeding the mass and other synthetic drugs in the region. Uh, and I will move to the third questions. I will leave the second questions to uh, Jeremy. Uh, when it comes to fentanyl, uh, it's not, of course, uh, not really uh, noted uh, when it comes to fentanyl use in the region. Uh, however, there is some, um, some indications, the availability of this particular substance. Uh, for instance, uh, in Korea, uh, there were uh, people been uh, using, especially younger populations, been uh, fentanyl uh, pharmaceutical products uh, for non-medical use. Uh, it's quite noted over the last few years. Uh, so a number of prescriptions for fentanyl uh, been increased over the last few years, uh, which could create some uh, demand for the illegal uh, synthetic opioid products. Uh, but at the moment, uh, other than that, uh, not really that we have seen the uh, fentanyl use in the region. Okay. We have seen an uptick in heroin supply, which is not the same, but just uh, notably in Shan State last year. Uh, and uh, we're looking at, we're analyzing the data right now, we're in the middle of it for the uh, opium production uh, this year. And so we'll publish it at the end. But it's a uh, there was a notable increase last year, so fentanyl hasn't yet infiltrated the heroin market here in this region, or at least minimally. Um, so I would just, just add that, I think. The other uh, uh, point uh, that you may ask about uh, tablet marks, so ONCB actually, kudos to them, they do really incredible tracking of this. Uh, so what they do is they actually track the shipments and analyze the markings across the shipments, uh, and they share that uh, forensic intelligence with us, it's really helpful because what they, the, it's primarily the packaging. Sometimes the tool markings are similar or they're slightly different, but the packaging themselves associated with different small armed groups is very different. So we've got uh, an emergence up to now 24% from two pre-coup or pre-military takeover, right, in the country. So we have a very distinct change within that. I think that has profound sub-regional challenges because now you no longer have single two dominant suppliers. You have now a couple dozen, really, suppliers. Yeah, okay. Uh, may I add on just a little bit regarding the, you know, Yaba, the meth tablets, the forensic lab. Our work, we, we have done for a long time we, because we, we have the labs of our own uh, kind of the institute and, you know, almost the exhibits of the cases, more than 80%, we, we have the lab analysis at or NCB, so we have a very good data bank, not just only physical, but also the, the scientific evidence regarding the an analytical results. So we compare even, you know, the degree of the Y, long tail, short tail, how many degree different like that, and actually it's help in intelligence um, uh, investigation expansion as well, because we can tell which group you know, after we analyze that, we can see the, you know, the customized uh, logos and stuff, and we can identify the groups who produce it or who, who, who you know, who, who make the tablet like that. Okay, so if you want to learn more, you, you're more than welcome to come to visit our lab. And also you can, we, we, we produce quarterly report regarding, regarding our analytical results, not just only the Yaba, it's also ice and ketamine and yeah and happy water as well. So you're more than welcome if you want to. And regarding fentanyl, we just went to US and it's quite a concern. And the, you know, uh, it's the good news. We have the recent uh, big project with the DEA. Yes, we have some DEA chemicals experts here as well. Oh, <laughs> not hiding though. Yeah. Um, Good news, at this moment, we can guarantee that uh, at the Golden Triangle, they still not start the production of fentanyl yet because we have the program earlier before the DEA jumped in, uh, the cooperation with the, you know, with the labs in the, in the CLMV countries, Thailand uh, uh, has been long supporter for them for development of their analytical, forensic analytical uh, work. So we provide them with the equipment, GC, GCMC, and you know, and the training for capacity building as well. And we collect the data of our neighboring country as well. So recently we, we told DEA at the headquarters as well that the samples, we have a big project now. Um, uh, we're gonna collect more than, I think, uh, 
300, but right now we start analyze already f so far 100, I think none of them show the, the you know, the trace of making fentanyl. So uh, yeah, for safe side at this moment. <laughs> Okay. Thank you. Okay, uh, one question from the floor. And uh, after this question, we also have some more questions from online. So after this question, online questions. Hello, Laura Becker from the BBC. Uh, thank you so much for presenting your report to us today. Um, I've got two questions. Again, I'm going to be that, that person. Um, if I can ask the first one on Myanmar, it's a significant um, increase in seizures in Myanmar. Which outside police forces are working with the junta within Myanmar to ensure that these routes are looked at and monitored? Um, and what particular challenges are you facing within Myanmar since the coup? And secondly, when it comes to the maritime routes, I mean, I saw yesterday when I was speaking um, with uh, officers when we were looking at the seizure yesterday of the Crystal Met, he was saying that it takes 100 officers to go through the intelligence, it's a four month operation. So does that mean with the diversion of these routes, you're gonna have to move more officers towards the Ironman Sea or the Gulf of Thailand? Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Maybe. Uh, res respond to the second question first. Actually, no need to remove, but I think uh, coordination uh, closer because we have Sanchon um, TMAC, I think uh, English, the, the shorter name. Because actually we, we cooperate with, with them for a long time and you know, it's their authority for, for the region, the maritime region that they, 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 they have the power on. And we, you know, we have the integrated forces under Sanchon. So it can work, uh, um, I think, effectively already. Basically, uh, whether it will be successful or not, is, is it begins from the good intelligence first you know, to, to beef up the, the authorities at, at the end of the process, I think it's, it, it's not difficult. We have the Region 2, or NCB Region 2, we have Police Region 2, we have Sanchon, we have, uh, for, you know, beefing up the, the force is, is not difficult. But to monitor and keep tracks, we, we can follow them from the north, we can follow them and we can talk to the neighboring countries. So. It's just to keep up with the trends, with the intelligence, with the informant, whether we verified it uh, well, and we can keep track them, and then they can start the operation nicely. Th this one, uh, to the second question. Regarding the challenges, the real challenge in Myanmar. Uh, uh, as long as the security, <laughs> political and security uh, issues in, this is the answer from the high level, the policy level in Myanmar government though, when we try to, you know, ask for cooperation from them, they said, okay, as long as the political and security issues still there, uh, no, reversely, actually, they said, uh, they try to solve the political and you know, the social security problem in their country first, and then um, the, the drug problem will, will succeed. So the real challenge uh, I can interpret from what they say means that um, we need to help them, you know, to, to at least a certain degree of the political and peace along the border, so then the authority themselves can get access to, to the problematic area along the border. In particular, that's the strategic area for, for Thailand. Yeah? Talk, I talk on behalf of the Thailand and Thailand government only. Uh, okay, in particular, the situation along the border in the north of Thailand, we also have the proactive uh, projects there as well, and has been for more than two decades. Um, you might have known the alternative development that we is the two-pronged strategy, not just only to you know increase the stability and political uh, peace and stability in, along the area to reduce the problem of the drug production. It's also the long-term and sustainable development to help them to you know find the alternative income. Yeah, that's uh, at least we. We're successful to have our Thai project in the territory of Myanmar along the border. Yeah. 
I, I would add to, to that. Uh, you asked a kind of two-part question there. Uh, one was who's cooperating, and clearly Thailand has a relationship with, with Myanmar, which is ongoing. Uh, ours is a bit uh, fragmented at the moment, but nonetheless, we have staff in the country that are doing good work in Shan State. Uh, as well as other parts of the country on different topics, alternative development or drug treatment. Um, but this, the, there are other countries uh, cooperating, China, other neighboring uh, countries are also cooperating. Even international partners are currently cooperating. Uh, if you follow you know, Senate testimony in Australia, you'll see that they are. Uh, they, the national police chief has testified to that effect. They just, uh, again, testified to that effect last week, in my understanding, where they talked about the extent to which that cooperation is ongoing. Uh, so there's, it's very clear that there is cooperation from a number of governments for the reasons that Kun Ying just said, which is, if you're going to address this problem, you have to have conversations with people in the country, despite the fact that the situation, the political and security situation, is very challenging. I, and to that point, I would say, if you look at the overall Myanmar figure, and then you look at that one map that Inchik presented with the different decreases and increases in different parts and the different trafficking routes in the country, I think it's quite concerning what we see in Shan State. Shan State is the epicenter of production for Asia Pacific, and yet seizures dropped in that state massively last year. Why? It's because of the political and security situation in Shan State in a sense, uh, there's a lack of access by certain uh, authorities. Uh, there's a, or a lack of capacity, uh, given the current security context, to go into Shan State. And essentially, that allows a lot of these little groups that are tableting or a lot of the other groups that are producing ice to essentially have a free hand. They've allowed that, 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 that in turn has a spillover effect into Thailand, into the center of Myanmar or the rest of the region. Where, and therefore the change in, in trafficking routes. So you have to really drill into the country to see where that's dropping. But to see it drop in Shan like that uh, is unprecedented. It's never occurred. Uh, and that's directly related to other data. If you look in the country uh, around conflict and so on and so forth, you can't look at the two types of information as separate. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I know it's close to 12, but I think we, there are still some online questions. I think we can take two online questions and then maybe end. Uh, so the first question also related to the maritime trafficking is, we have a question on uh, bearing in mind the difficulty of interdicting the flow of products, quote unquote, sailing by and traveling on land. Does the panel see the potential for drone surveillance, both for smuggling and uh, IUU fishing? So illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing. Dro drone surveillance. Yes, uh, drone surveillance, yeah. So I, I can answer in general terms, and maybe Kun Ying can add, but I, there are drones in use by governments in the region to track at the borders in the north, but also I understand Timec uh, as well uses drone technology uh, to track maritime shipments. I can't speak to the extent of it, but they are doing that. We've also worked with Timec uh, and provided some technology in that space uh, to help them to have to do some surveillance, but maybe you want to, is there anything to add? No? Yeah. Right. Using all technologies that can help. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Good <laughs> point. <laughs> yeah. yeah, great. So uh, I think the, the last question for, for today, considering the time, uh, this is a question on chemicals. Maybe Inshik, maybe you could take this one. Uh, the question is, uh, what is the latest situation on the chemical trade? It must be massive, considering all the drugs that are coming out of the region. Where are all the chemicals coming from? <laughs> Yes, the, the chemical uh, is, of course, massive quantities of chemicals have been traded, also uh, traffic as well. But the, uh, if we have to name the countries uh, when it comes by quantities, probably China, India, which is not surprising because given their, their legitimate chemical industry size compared to other countries. But I would say that Asia in general, because Asia is a home for the chemical uh, industry, basically at the global level. So we see so several other countries in the regions, uh, including Thailand, Vietnam, uh, whose chemicals have been uh, coming from this part of the world to the uh, drug production site in the region. Actually, I would add something very interesting about that. Uh, the, so we've seen, he mentioned in his uh, talk that non-controlled chemicals are increasingly in use. Uh, he also just mentioned China and India as the two big sources. This year has seen a particular uptick in supply from India, which may indicate controls in China are more effective, it, time will tell. Um, but I think if you look at, for example, he presented a very unique situation. We were in a drug lab, not myself, he and, uh, and a couple of colleagues last year for several days 
a series of drug labs and warehouses in Cambodia documenting everything. Uh, and in the Cambodian context, with all of those large ketamine laboratories and synthetic drug laboratories, there were chemicals found from 12 countries. And we, we've taken the labels and documented that, literally 12 countries around the world. The dominance was this region, like chemicals important and less important from different countries, but also as far afield as Europe. It's quite amazing what was in there through brokers that are based here in the region. But nonetheless, that's, that shows you that I think there's creativity and sourcing when, in, when necessary. Uh, you can get them from various, various sources. It's also very important when you're talking about chemicals, though, to look at this region as the epicenter of the global chemical trade, because you cannot have production in Mexico without chemicals, and they come from here. So when you see the, uh, the, the, the answer to the, the Mexican cartels was partial, because fundamentally they are here, they're sourcing chemicals here, uh, but potentially through different marketplaces online, but also physically with their partners here in the region uh, procuring chemicals. Thank you. Yes, uh, last question. Then. <laughs> Sorry for the last minute. Um, my name is Lin Hao. I'm from uh, Xinhua News Agency. Um, you touch on the, um, the cross-border cooperation a little bit. Um, China is the, I mean, it's bordering the major routes, uh, the Golden Triangles and those kind of things. Um, can you like, explain like China's roles in um, cross-border uh, with among your agency and, and, um, and the regional cooperation in, in tackling the problem you have um, outlined today? Hmm. Yeah, we, we work uh, fairly closely with China, particularly an agency called the NNCC, which is part of the Ministry of Public Security. Um, so we work extensively with them on data analysis, but also some projects, some cooperation projects. Uh, and this year they're hosting a political process of the Mekong states. Uh, the ministers from the Mekong will be gathering in Beijing to discuss an action plan on drug trafficking in and production and use in the Mekong region. So they take a bit of a political leadership role in that sense with the Mekong states. We act as a bit of a secretariat for that process. So we have a very good, uh, close, cooperative uh, relationship uh, with China as an agency, uh, as uh, they are a key member state, P5 Security Council member in the UN. So we work with them. Uh, at the same time, you asked another part to your question, which was about the China being on the front lines. I think we witnessed last year that drop in Yunnan. Yunnan is the gateway in to China for the product out of the Golden Triangle. And a massive drop occurred within China, largely driven by a drop within Yunnan. Uh, and that is as a result from everything, all the indicators we have, the increased effort that they put on the border there was very, very significant. So they had a lot of extra law enforcement presence and border control effort placed there. They also had another effort, which was Operation Clean Borders, which was to stop chemical flow going through, which may indicate why we're seeing other countries pick up in terms of the supply of chemical into the Golden Triangle, uh, i.e. India. But the point being that that drop drove the regional drop. So there, the China is on the front lines, but China has had a massive effort on those front lines, just a little less publicized than other states. Thank you. Uh, okay, just to add on, um, just, um, yeah, just agree and more information regarding the uh, China cooperation with the countries in the sub-region, not just only the framework of the UNODC, they also initiated a project called the uh, Safe Mekong yeah, Coordination uh, uh, Project. So at this moment, it's still running on, and you know, um, they put a real hard effort because they conduct many operations along the border as well. Uh, in particular, with Thailand, we, we, we quite joined and quite tightly regarding the, you know, the chemical controls. They also provide a lecture and also the training course for, for the chemical controls for the countries in this region as well. Yeah, just to yeah, add on. Okay, uh, thank you very much. I think you know it's a bit after 12. I think that's enough uh, for today, for time for today. For everyone who's here, we'll still be around, so if you have any questions, you can come up to us and ask us after the event is over. Uh, so thank you very much once again for joining us. Uh, you can download a copy of the report from the UNODC Regional Office website. It's available there now. And uh, thank you very much once again for coming and for joining us today. Thank you. <laughs>